Good afternoon. I'm David Levy. I'm dean of the Duke Law School. Uh, this is a wonderful day. This is the first David L. Lang lecture in intellectual property. This lecture was formerly known as the Fry Lecture and has brought top intellectual scholar, intellectual property scholars and practitioners to Duke uh, for many years. Last year, in honor of David Lang and his many years of teaching and scholarship here, uh, Kip and Meredith Fry very generously asked that the lecture be renamed for David, and so it has. Thank you, Kip. Thank you, Meredith. Kip is here. Now, a, a word about David Lang. One could say much more. Uh, David came to Duke in 1971, and he retired last year after 45 years of service to the law school and the law school community. He taught, and he wrote, and he became the Melvin Shim professor, and he's still a force, and I mean a force in our present. So many have been influenced and moved to tears or laughter or exasperation uh, <laughs> by David's eloquence, by his wit, his insight, and his ideas. We are very fortunate to welcome uh, Professor William Fisher today as the first of our Lang lectures. Professor James Boyle has the honor of the introduction. Uh, Professor Boyle is the William Neal Reynolds Professor at Duke Law School. He's a leader in the study of the public domain. His books and articles are truly pathbreaking. And his latest publication with Jennifer Jenkins is a comic book entitled Theft, A History of Music. And it is a must read. Professor Boyle. I have the uh, honor to introduce Professor William Fisher, who's the Wilmer Hale Professor of Intellectual Property at Harvard Law School, director of the Berkman Center, and as you will see if you leave the little cards in your lunch, um, kind of a big deal uh, in many regards. Um, when uh, Professor Fisher was asked to give this lecture, he emailed me immediately saying how honored he was, particularly honored to give the first Lang lecture, because as he said, I am a big fan of David's. And if you know, uh, Professor Fisher's understated man. This is the equivalent of me doing cartwheels while waving a vuvuzuela in the air. Um, big fan is, is, is pretty close to the top of his superlative list. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce him. I, I can't um, but say that when Terry, uh, who is nicknamed Terry, when, Will, when Professor Fisher said this, he was referring principally to David's role as scholar and David's role as public intellectual. And we're also honoring something else here uh, which is David's role as teacher. Um, David has taught many people over the years. One of those people is Professor Kip Fry, uh, who generously created this lecture with his wife Meredith. Um, and uh, a, a film school graduate, he sat in David's classes and thought, you know, this law stuff might actually enable forms of creativity that I could go on to do, and proceeded as a venture capitalist, as a CEO, and an innovator in multiple areas uh, to show that that was true, inspiration. Uh, can actually yield very concrete results. Uh, I invite you to look at his bio. He's the head of our Law and Entrepreneurship Program, of course. Um, I can't refrain from saying that while, as a CEO and, and venture capitalist, uh, Kip's ventures have met with almost universal success, there was one just tiny thing that he missed, the, the kind of opportunity to be like the first to fund Google that you just get away. While at the Turner Broadcasting uh, Network running a troubled uh, series of running a, a very successful business, but which had one wrestling franchise not doing well. Um, he talked to David about it, and David suggested quite seriously that the network's fortunes could be resurrected if Kip were to allow David to wrestle um, in this as Professor Terror. <laughs> Amazingly, he let this one go by. Um, and I'm sure that you must lie awake at nights saying, if only I had, you know, like, if only I had made that catch. But, so that's the one thing that we, we have not got out of this collaboration. But thank you, Kip and David. Um, Professor Fisher uh, and I share a preference for short encomia of praise, introducing a speaker on the theory that if the speech is terrible, then the big introduction just makes it worse. And if the speech is great, then the introduction is unnecessary. Um, I can't help, though, than say that if you look at 
His bio, and particularly if you go to his faculty page, the sheer breadth of his writing uh, invites both um, envy um, and, and, and a, a great degree of wonder. Uh, his work has ranged from fair use through discussions of cultural theory to discussions uh, of access to medicines, uh, property theory, the history of intellectual property, and to the subject on which he will speak today, traditional knowledge, which, as you will see, is both a vexed and a fascinating issue. We're delighted to welcome here, him here for the inaugural Lang Lecture. Professor Christie. I was instructed. No, no, I was instructed that the uh, system would turn it on. Uh, well, technology. I would. Why don't we try that, and I will see if I can get you. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you to Jamie for a kind introduction and for um, your hospitality. Um, as Jamie rightly indicated, I am especially happy to be here because of the um, esteem in which I've held David for a long time. He has struck me um, as especially admirable in his willingness uh, quietly, modestly, to bring to bear on this field the values of humanism, uh, not just in his writing, but in the way he deals with people. Um, I can't say much about his teaching. I've never seen him teach. But I have seen him in conferences. And uh, the way he um, addresses uh, colleagues embodies the values of sincerity, respect, uh, intelligence, gentleness. So thank you, David. I am going to speak today about a topic that has um, puzzled many scholars in the field of intellectual property, including me, for a long period of time. It is also, as it happens, a subject of considerable current debate, because after a hiatus period of a few years, the World Intellectual Property Organization is reconsidering the questions we'll be addressing here today. So the topic um, merits attention, as I say, both because of its complexity and because of its current importance. So what is traditional knowledge? Uh, there's a fair amount of struggle over the appropriate definition within the field of scholarship. I'm going to use provisionally the following, traditional knowledge as I will employ the term, means understanding or skill developed and preserved by the members of an indigenous group concerning either actual potential socially beneficial uses of biological resources, that tends to be medical uses, or B, cultural practices. And such cultural practices have in the past and could in the future include rituals, narratives, poems, images, designs, clothing, fabrics, music, and dances. Now, the reason why we can um, stick, for the moment, with a loose and provisional definition of that sort is that, for reasons I hope become apparent by the end of this lecture, the precision of the definition is less critical for my own approach than it is for many of the other approaches in the field. So more helpful, I think, in getting a sense of the problem that needs to be addressed is to examine some case studies. Well, I'm going to present to you four of, excuse me, eight of these, three involving the uses of biological resources, five involving traditional cultural expressions. This is going to take uh, some time because they're complicated. That's part of the point. And then we'll plunge into the normative analysis. And at the very end of the lecture, return to these examples and bring the proposals I'll be making to bear upon these fact situations. So here's the first one. It's an old one. Uh, this plant, the rosy periwinkle, 
originated, it seems, in the West Indies, but soon spreads throughout uh, the tropics over long periods of time. Indigenous groups, including groups in the Philippines uh, and Jamaica, observed that it had medicinal powers, in particular that it uh, could be employed to treat diabetes and then um, less serious ailments like sore throat, pleurisy, and dysentery. The Eli Lilly Company in the 1950s drew upon this information, this knowledge, to um, experiment with, to purify and then test the Rosie Periwinkle. They actually collected the samples from India and Madagascar, but relied on the knowledge primarily from the Philippines and Jamaica. And from that, they distilled, tested, and patented two drugs, vincristine and vinblastine, which actually did not work for diabetes, but were very effective in dealing with childhood leukemia and earned Lilly over $200 million a year. Uh, none of the possibly relevant groups those in Jamaica, Madagascar, India, or the Philippines enjoyed any of that revenue. Right, that's the first example. It's, uh, as I say, a quite old and familiar example in this field. Here's a somewhat more recent one. For a very long time, roughly 25,000 years, the San people, sometimes known pejoratively as the Bushmen, have lived in this sector of southern Africa. Their numbers were reasonably stable over millennia until the, uh, excuse me, the 17th century when um, genocide, primarily by the Dutch, reduced their numbers from about 300,000 to 100,000. But they still lived in the same area, practicing traditional nomadic um, ways of gathering their food. So here are some images of San. And they still occupy significant portions of South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia. In the same area occupied by the sun, this plant, Hudia, grows. And the sun discovered over these millennia, it too had medicinal powers. In particular, it was an appetite suppressant. And it helped to deal with indigestion and infections. A detail here, which we may come relevant later on, is the, this is the current distribution of Hudia, the plant, and this is where the San currently live. So they're not exactly on top of where the biological resource currently is located, but close. A company, a research-based company in South Africa, CSIR, relying upon the folk knowledge concerning the medicinal benefits of Hudia began, like Eli Lilly, to test it and ascertained that a particular compound, which they called P57, was indeed medicinally powerful and did have appetite suppressant potential. And they patented it, CSIR patented it, in South Africa not actually in most of the rest of the world, but in South Africa. And they then cut a deal with a British firm, Phytopharm, to develop and distribute any drug that would emerge from this. And Phytopharm promised to pay them a significant amount of money, a bit up front, but mostly in the form of milestone payments and then a share of the royalties over time. Phytopharm then quickly partnered in 1998 with Pfizer to do most of the testing. And then the observer in England got a hold of this story, and in particular revealed that the sun from which the information had come, and who are almost without exception impoverished, weren't getting any share of the benefits, and uh, put pressure on CSIR to do better. And so there ensued negotiations. And the fruit of those negotiations was a very complicated and interesting trust which was set up on behalf of the various Sun groups in the three principal countries in South Africa. And the key financial element of this is CSIR promised to pay between 6 and 8%, very slightly by circumstance, of the revenues they gathered from Phytopharm 
to the trust, which in turn distributed in a variety of ways to the sun. Unfortunately, it turned out that Houdia has some side effects, and so Pfizer withdrew. Phytopharm temporarily aligned itself with Unilever, but Unilever also despaired of generating something that um, would be commercially viable, so they withdrew, and so probably the sun will in the end not get anything out of this, not because of bad arrangements, but because of the limitations of the drug. So incidentally, in the vein of news you can use, if you go into health food stores around here, you will see things that list Houdia as a um, component. Don't buy them. Uh, it turns out, probably, that it does indeed have appetite suppression powers, but that's because it's doing bad things to you. So. OK, so third example. It's been known for a long time that quasia amara, a um, drug, that, excuse me, a plant that grows in this area of the world, also has medical possibilities. One of the countries where it is most common we used is French Guiana. This is what it looks like. Another research organization, this time based in France, IRD, um, knowing that it potentially had medical benefits, went to, um, had personnel go to French Guiana and interviewed members of these five groups. Now, the Kalina are a traditional indigenous group in French Guiana. Uh, descendants of the Carib, they live here. The uh, Palacor uh, are partly in Guiana and partly in Brazil. And then, as you can see, there are Creole, Brazilians, and Europeans, all of whom were employing this plant for um, malaria. So. The researchers, the ethnobotanists, returned with this information to France, identified an active substance, obtained a European patent in 2015, from which they anticipate making, in this case, probably quite a lot of money if it is indeed as beneficial for treating malaria as it appears. The arrangement, once again, came to the attention of the press, which um, shamed. Uh, IRD into promising to the government of French Guiana, this is actually important, a flow of money if there are commercial benefits to the drug. Whether any of that money will make its way to the indigenous groups remains to be seen. That's number three. Number four, this is a uh, Wankina spirit image. It appears on a cave in northwest Australia. The indigenous group that um, has created and associated themselves with these images over a very long period of time repaint them annually on the ceilings of caves. They have a lot of cultural and religious significance for this group. Here they are in the process of repainting. Some years ago, suddenly, unexpectedly, in Perth, graffiti artists began to draw upon the Wanhina spirit images in the drawings they put on walls. And this spread very fast. So they're on brick walls. And they are modified in various ways from the originals, but clearly recognizable as Wanhina spirit images. The aboriginal group, furious over what they regarded as desecration of their cultural heritage. A lot of public debate. Nothing came of it. Fifth example, again from Australia, although this one also implicates Vietnam. The aboriginal group in the northern tip of Australia subscribes to a ancestor myth or ancestor narrative that contemplates that the original arrivals on this peninsula transferred their land to this particular clan with a set of duties associated 
with this land. And those duties in particular included performing ceremonies, producing patterns of paintings, and uh, commemorating the journey. The um, head of the clan, this man, conferred upon a young woman artist, Banduk Marika, a license, or what we would describe as a revocable license, to produce images based upon the traditional motifs. And she created this one, uh, which is a symbolic rendering of a kind of monitor lizard that's common in northern Australia around a watering hole. The precise significance of this image, she didn't know, because it can't be revealed to women. So she creates the image, and then um, gives permission to produce it, to reproduce it, to a anthropologist who promises to treat it respectfully and educate the world at large in the imagery of indigenous groups. A company in Vietnam making carpets obtained a copy of the book and produced a carpet with this image on it and then shipped the carpets, fatally for them, back to Sydney where they are sold in a company called Indofern. Now, the images are not identical. But for the copyright folk in the room, this is striking similarity. There's no question that copying was going on. So here, geographically, is what happened. This is the original clan. The image is created there. It's exhibited in the National Gallery in Canberra. It's then, as I say, produced in a book, which appears in Vietnam. The carpet is made there. It's then shipped to Indofern. And a copyright infringement suit is initiated in Australia. Now, this is unusual because both the plaintiff and the defendant are in the same country. Rare under these circumstances, but illustrative. And so what's the outcome? The Australian court finds in favor of the plaintiff, orders damages in the form of 188,000 Australian dollars, which I think is about half that in US dollars. The money is not given to. Um, Marika alone. It's distributed to all the artists who are in a similar position. And then um, the Indofern had to turn over all of the carpets that remained in the store. They didn't have to retrieve those that had already been sold. And they were burned publicly. Okay, Kente cloth is a brightly colored fabric produced in a particular sector of West Africa, which has a lot of symbolic significance. So this is the zone. And it's originally created by the Yui and Ashanti indigenous groups. In the beginning, its use is tightly limited to only men and only rulers. Uh, here's some illustrations of it. So this illustrates the different dress codes of rulers in different countries. But Americans are not quite so careful. <laughs> so the kente cloth generated in these countries then begins to spread culturally, primarily into the United States, where it is used increasingly often by African American college students in stoles for graduation, and then slowly penetrates other cultural forms. Earrings, iPhone covers, covers for lamps, bow ties, BMW steering wheel covers. None of the fruits of these sales go to the Yui or Ashanti in Ghana. OK, only a few more to go. This is a uh, carpet. In Western Tibet, a set of images that draws heavily on Buddhism, woven by Tibetan um, weavers who 
use a particular strain of wool found, not surprisingly, in the mountains in that area. A lot of religious significance, despite the fact that these are carpets and are walked upon. So this is an example of a Tibetan rug. Culturally originates here in the 1950s when many residents of Tibet are driven out of the region by the government of the People's Republic of China. They, most of them, settle in Nepal where they carry on producing these rugs and shipping them to customers in Western Europe and the United States. So here are some of the rugs you can buy. You can obtain them on eBay for modest prices. Or you can go to companies like this, Rallo, which advertises itself, I think truthfully, as being founded by a Nepalese weaver and committed to sharing the revenue, the quite substantial revenue, that they earn from their rugs with uh, the weavers in Nepal and with groups in Nepal, Tibet, and New York City that cherish and sustain the traditions of Buddhism. A complication. If you buy a Tibetan rug in a store in New York from Rallo, it will indeed resemble one of the sets of patterns that were traditional in Tibet circa 1800. But not tightly. The patterns produced in Nepal are shifting to accommodate Americans' taste for geometric patterns. So they're authentic, but they're changing under the pressure of the market. All right, here's the last case study. The Bantu in southern Africa, one of the groups that was partly displacing the San, were, at the time of um, slavery in the Western Hemisphere was getting off the ground, concentrated in these regions, and many were forcibly taken from those countries to, by the Spanish traders, to the southern part of um, Latin America, in particular around the Rio Plata. So this is the zone we're going to be talking about for a minute. When they arrived, the slaves uh, began to dance oh, this should be here, using dances that had been traditional in the parts of Africa from which they came. And the dance forms were reasonably stable, but they began to, began to evolve, and they came to be known as kandombe. And then the practice of dancing this fashion began to leak across racial and class boundaries, so into lower middle class dancers in Uruguay, and then um, upper class dancers in Uruguay, and then to London, where the tango, which is the outcome of this dance tradition, becomes popular, specifically in 1912. Very soon thereafter, cultural transmission moves across the Atlantic, and beginning in 1913, the tango starts to penetrate American popular culture. It's popularized in part by Arthur Murray, who invents a new way of teaching dance, in which he created drawings that showed where the man and the woman are supposed to put their feet. And he advertised his studios by distributing these drawings. OK, so tango continues to spread in American culture, memorialized in movies. And then, most recently, moves to Seattle. How does it move to Seattle? Well, Seattle was in the process of building a new subway system and here. And when they built the new subway system, they wanted some art to cover up the rebuilt area. And so they commissioned an artist named Mackie to uh, build a sculpture which he did. This is it being installed, goes into the sidewalk, and once installed, enables people to learn and dance tango. Then the Seattle Symphony 
proud of the cultural heritage of their city, commissioned a photographer to take pictures of the footsteps in the sidewalk and included that photograph in a brochure. So the chain here is Kandombe, Tango, Arthur Murray, Mackey the sculptor, Reiser the photographer, and the Seattle Symphony. Now there is a copyright infringement suit that emerges from this. Mackey brings suit against the Seattle Symphony. But that's not our concern. Our concern is that Kandombe survives and it is still danced in Uruguay. So our puzzle here is, well, what about these people? Are they, are they entitled to anything? OK. So that was 20 minutes. It's a long time, but necessary, I think, to get a sense of this complicated field. And now we're going to turn to a normative analysis. In the, as I say, substantial literature on traditional knowledge, there are five main arguments that have been made in favor of enhanced protection, and three arguments that have been made against it. I'm simplifying somewhat, but not a lot. So I'm going to summarize the arguments for you, and then subject each one of them to what used to be called internal critique meaning take its premises as given and examine how well they hold up. And this process will, I hope, eliminate some as credible arguments. In particular, three of these are going to drop out, but leave others in place. And after this process of sifting, we're going to end up with a shortened list, but still a difficult list to manage. We're going to take the remaining arguments and subject them to critical scrutiny using what I'll be describing as cultural theory and see what pops out. So first argument is uh, possession. After all, with respect to a whole lot of other resources, we give ownership of resources to the person or group that happens to possess them. So Law students, most of you are law students, it seems, are familiar with many of these cases involving wild animal, diamond, Less obvious, but really important globally, is oil. Why do we give Saudi Arabia all that money? Well, it's because they happen physically to be overlying an area where there's a lot of oil. Land titling systems in Latin America are founded on the same principle. So possession is a really important guide to property rights. And if we conclude that property rights and genetic resources in particular are a good idea, then there's a presumptive argument for giving rights to the persons or groups in current possession of them. And that turns out to be interesting from the standpoint of the first three case studies we're considering. So these, this is how global biodiversity is concentrated. As you can see, there are three main areas in the world where there's a great deal of biological diversity. and. This is where the indigenous groups are concentrated. So presumptive argument for giving the groups entitlements over the physical resources that happens, perhaps fortuitously, perhaps not, to be currently possessed by them. OK, so that's the first of the arguments. Here's the critique. First, unfortunately, the alignment between the locations of the groups from which the knowledge concerning the uses of these resources emanated and the resources themselves is imperfect, as I indicated in one of the case studies with respect to the sun. So there's slippage already. A more fundamental and serious problem is that even the scholars most enthusiastic about the normative significance of possession, such as Richard Epstein, concede that it's basically a presumption, a presumption in favor of giving entitlements to the first possessor, but a presumption that can be overcome relatively easily by stronger normative arguments, of which there are many in this zone. So even though at the threshold it has some initial attraction, my suggestion is we discard 
possession as a guideline. The same fate is going to be suffered by utility, the criterion employed by the dominant welfare theory of intellectual property, how the utilitarian criterion is sometimes applied to traditional knowledge is it is in a unusual way. There's no credible argument that assignment of intellectual property rights to the groups is necessary to induce the creation of the knowledge. The argument is rather that giving them entitlements will prompt them to preserve it and preserve the resources over which they have custody, for example, to prevent cutting down of the rainforest. It's an argument, it's an argument that unfortunately more or less succeeded in the Eldred case, but it's a weak argument. Why is it a weak argument? Because if you are serious about cost-benefit analysis, it turns out there are plenty of alternative, less intrusive incentives for the preservation of the knowledge and the resources, and the welfare losses associated with conferring market power upon the holders of this knowledge would be very large. So if you're concerned with welfare, you are likely to conclude that enhancing the rights of the indigenous groups is not sensible. Fairness, the dominant alternative to welfare as a theory of intellectual property, here has two implications. One is many forms of traditional knowledge originated out of sustained work by members of the indigenous community to discover and test the uses of knowledge. And a more dramatic example, corrective justice, the indigenous groups with which we are primarily concerned were the victims of patterns of colonization and exploitation over long periods of time. So this is a more substantial argument, but it has some, in my view, fatal weaknesses. And the first is another misalignment problem, that if you're serious about tracing patterns of exploitation and correcting them, then you have to track patterns of colonization and exploitation, which historically are complicated. And then against this backdrop, reorient entitlements to match who has done what to whom. Very difficult, and it will produce some arbitrary result. That's the first of the two problems. And the second is that even if one could achieve such precise tracing, it's normatively problematic to transfer both rights and obligations across generations, the sins of the father, and so forth. OK, this leaves then two arguments that, in my view, are subject to partial critique, but not full critique. And they are going to be durable in the analysis. The first is uh, distributive justice, not corrective justice, not redressing wrongs in the past. Distributive justice looking forward and recognizing that there is a very high degree of inequality in the world that adversely affects indigenous groups. So the inequality comes in two forms. First is they live in parts of the world that are poor. And within those parts of the world, they are poorer than average by a lot. They also live in parts of the world where life expectancy is low and when the incidence of contagious diseases is high. And within those parts of the world, they are sicker than most. So extreme forms of inequality, which could be redressed, at least in part, through reassignment of valuable entitlements, of which a claim on traditional knowledge would be one. OK. To be sure, this is not an airtight argument. Addressing inequality through the assignment of traditional knowledge is surely less precise and effective than a straightforward rights wealth transfer. 
and occasionally will result in morally arbitrary distinctions among poor groups, because poor groups without traditional knowledge lose out. But it still has a fair amount of normative force within the premises of theories of distributed justice. And we finally arrive at communitarian theory, an argument that points in the same direction for different reasons. Traditional cultural expressions, in particular, are central to the identities of many indigenous groups. And in particular, their religious ceremonies are central to their senses of self. And consequently, to the extent we value communities, we should respect the things that give them life. The critique here is that a hazard of fetishizing ancient forms of traditional knowledge and conferring upon those things economic value creates a practical risk of impeding the evolution of cultural practices that foster more accurate and fulfilling forms of community. OK, a problem to be borne in mind, but a worry rather than a fatal objection. OK, so those are the arguments in favor, filtered. The arguments against filtered are first that protections for traditional knowledge would encroach on the public domain, defined as the zone or reservoir of information and ideas that anyone can draw upon for free for enjoyment or for the creation of new products. Now, this is a field in which scholars here have devoted a great deal of productive work. And I think that in this particular context, it's unhelpful. <laughs> so why? That's why it wasn't me. <laughs> so <laughs> why is that particularly in this context, the set of ideas that fits the definitions I just supplied is modest and more relevant for analytical precision is subsets of knowledge that are subject to a variety of freedoms and restrictions. And our goal in this area should be to identify the set of restrictions and freedoms that will advance other values rather than to take as talismanic the idea of the public domain. There's a separate practical argument, which is it's politically fraught that through a complicated history, the concept of the public domain has become seen as a hypocritical gesture by developed countries. And developing countries hate this language. OK, so for two different reasons, I'm going to put this one to the side. But that doesn't mean that there are not powerful arguments against traditional knowledge. And the two, the loom largest, are first, practicability. One of the reasons for exploring these case studies is to illustrate the difficulty of tracing and fairly accounting for the contributions of various groups in some instances. And then there are supplementary problems, the difficulty of identifying who are the current representatives of those groups who should be entitled to regulate access to them or collect revenues. And then, if no such people already exist, it's hard, as a practical matter, to catalyze their emergence. So practical impediments. But now, partial critique from the other side, the Houdia case, which I reviewed earlier, and a case I did not explore involving southern India, both suggest that, yes, practical problems are often difficult, but they are solvable. Now, back to distributive justice, although this is frequently, as I indicated, deployed in favor of enhanced protection for traditional knowledge, it can also be deployed against it. And in particular, some commentators in this area argue that conferring power upon a group in practice results in enhancing the dominance 
of some folks within the groups. It exacerbates inequality rather than alleviates it. OK, so we take now a filtered set. So specifically, these two arguments, which survived the internal critique, and these two arguments, which also do, not done, because we're still left with a dilemma. So how to sort, or ideally reconcile, these competing claims? One of the central arguments of this presentation and of the book of which this will be a part is that you cannot achieve that reconciliation through continued pursuit of the project that I have been engaged in for the last 15 minutes, namely examining the force of each argument on its own terms. Instead, you have to supply and then apply a general theory, a general social theory, and a theory that can be brought to bear on intellectual property rights and traditional knowledge in particular. So the theory that I offer for these purposes goes by various names. The term I'll be using here is cultural theory. It has philosophically um, a bunch of old practitioners. In political theory, also a long heritage. Uh, important group of recent psychologists. In economics, believe it or not, a significant group of adherents. And within the legal system, a growing group of scholars who adopt this general approach. So what is this approach? Well, like all theories of intellectual property, it is best understood to be a family of approaches, not a single formula, that proceeds on the following premises. There is such a thing as human nature, which is mysterious but stable. People's nature causes them to flourish more under some conditions than others, which can be ascertained through the study of history and psychology. And normatively, social and political institutions should be organized to facilitate that flourishing. What are the conditions? There's an enormous amount of debate about this. But roughly speaking, there seem to be eight, eight conditions that are conducive to a flourishing life. They are life itself, reasonably obvious. Health, a little less obvious. Autonomy, the ability to choose among alternative life paths. Engagement in collective action in the workplace, in politics, and in shaping one's semiotic environment. Self-expression, projection of self into the world, a feeling of competence, of knowing what one is doing, social linkages, family, love, communities, and privacy. So the first third of this book explores these in some detail. For our purposes here, we're not going to pause on that and instead bring these arguments to bear on the aspects of culture implicated by traditional knowledge. So seen through the lens of cultural theory, we should be trying to do, with respect to culture, four things. First, foster diversity for the reasons identified long ago by John Stuart Mill. Cultivate, sustain a rich tradition of art. For example, one might not want to abolish the National Endowment of the Arts. <laughs> sustain education, and in particular, a generous, enlarged understanding of education that would be universally available and empowering throughout a lifetime. And finally, democracy understood capaciously to include politics, the workplace, and reshaping the meanings through which we daily move. 
So, if you adopt that perspective and then return to traditional knowledge, now things come into focus. There are still arguments, considerations that point in divergent directions. And in particular, there are arguments rooted in cultural theory in favor of enhanced shields for traditional knowledge. This one already mentioned. This one is pretty straightforward. And this one already mentioned. And then there are arguments that we have seen in favor of less protection for traditional knowledge. For example, exemplified by the Kente cloth case, opportunities facilitated by openness in this domain for self-expression through vehicles originally developed by others, and reducing overall the role of identity ascription. And finally, semiotic democracy, celebrating and facilitating the kind of cultural hybridization exemplified by tango. So having focused the analysis a bit, we now turn to a practical question. How could we design a legal regime that would reconcile these disparate aspirations as much as possible? Well, our task here should be, the reasons I hope are now apparent, to do the following three things. First, increase attribution respect and the redistribution of material resources, but not assign property rights which will function to impede both the use of traditional knowledge and will generate undesirable high transaction costs. Last but not least, we need a framework that will be responsive to the diversity of circumstances and values highlighted by the survey I did at the outset. So what might do that job? The regimes that have been either implemented or are currently on the table are not going to work. The current regime consists of a miscellaneous set of approaches adopted individually by countries. And as one might expect, they are extreme in their variety, conjoined with what's known in the trade as defensive protection. This capitalizes on the existing principle of originality and copyright, novelty and non-obviousness in patent law, and then seeks to fill our common discourse with awareness of the existence of traditional knowledge and therefore prevent the acquisition of intellectual property rights in, say, basmati rice by latecomers to the field. OK, it's not a terrible idea, but it will not go anywhere near far enough to achieve the balance of values I've identified. OK, that's the existing regime. The primary proposals in this area would replace that system with one of two models, a property rule or a liability rule. A property rule, familiar to the lawyers in the room, would give substantial power to the groups with which we are concerned, either through the reform of existing copyright and patent systems, or through a sui generis system supplemented by criminal penalties. I hope it's apparent by now why that would be a bad idea. The alternative, not as serious a problem, but still troubling, is mandatory benefit sharing, analogizing to material transfer agreements, and the kind of compulsory licenses that continue to flourish, unfortunately, in the US copyright regime. There's a lot of talk of this in Geneva. It is the principal objective of the more 
ambitious of the indigenous groups. My contention is that it will fail to appropriately accommodate the array of values apparent in those eight case studies. And so what we need instead is a distributed system. Now, by a distributed system, I mean one that integrates several layers or levels of semi-independent norm definition and enforcement. For the techies in the room, the best analog here is the domain name system, in which the root establishes an overall framework, but confers upon the independent country code top level domain the power to define the terms on which domain names will be distributed in their jurisdictions and disputes will be resolved. And both technologically and normatively, the system remains distributed and as a result evolves. So how would you create a distributed system with respect to traditional knowledge? There are two ways. Here's the first. This is what I'm describing as the delegation model. So I'll just pick one of these provisions out. There are three. Suppose that we modified the TRIPS agreement or some other international agreement to include the following provision. It shall be a defense to a claim of patent infringement that the inventors in developing the protected product or process relied substantially on materials or knowledge taken from a member of a country in violation of that country's laws. And as you can see, supplementary provisions involving copyright and trademark law. If you wanted, you could add the laws of the indigenous groups, not just the countries from which the material is taken. So think about the effect of such a provision. In practice, what it would do is Defendants in intellectual property suits in developed countries which had adopted such a provision would have a weapon in their hands. They would become private attorneys general seeking to invalidate the entitlements of the plaintiffs on the grounds that the plaintiffs had failed to respect the laws of Jamaica, Costa Rica, Ghana, and so forth. Aware of this threat, Commercial users of intellectual property, excuse me, commercial users of traditional knowledge would abide by local norms or negotiate with the relevant groups for permission. So the net effect is you distribute two countries' lawmaking authority with respect to commercial uses of traditional knowledge, but not non commercial uses. Okay, that's the first of the two. Here's the second. This is closer to the proposal that is more likely to get adopted in Geneva with some significant adjustments. So suppose that instead of creating a mandatory term of the sort I just described, you instead have a more modest regime in which Sellers of all products that are based upon traditional knowledge must disclose both their cultural provenance, meaning where they came from, and how they were made. Just disclose. And at the same time, you encourage the groups from which such things have been or are likely to be taken to articulate their expectations of fair treatment. What will the intersection of these two things do? It will energize two forms of pressure, the market and social sanctions, which, if you think back over the eight cases, has been the key impulse for corrective negotiation in every instance. 
So let's take these two proposals and by way of conclusion, reapply them to the eight examples. This was the rosy periwinkle. Either of the two regimes I've suggested would have the effect of prompting Eli Lilly to negotiate in advance a benefit sharing system with the affected indigenous groups or the countries. So there would be flows of money in a case like this. Number two, Hudia. The only difference in the Hudia case is that this regime would have emerged earlier rather than under pressure from the observer. The quasi-Amara case, however, would change because under either of these regimes, the French research organization would almost certainly have negotiated in advance, and not with the country, but with the groups. And the likelihood of money flowing to them would be increased. Number three. The delegation system, as I've described it, would have no effect on this because it's entirely non-commercial activities. The disclosure system might because anticipatory statements of expectations of fair treatment would shift public debate in Australia away from the values of freedom of speech toward the value of respect. The Indofern case, here, the delegation system would likely prompt Indofern and the Vietnamese manufacturer to choose a different pattern, a less vulnerable pattern. And the disclosure system would also prompt them to pay the affected indigenous group more. What about kente cloth? Here, the delegation system would prompt the Denver manufacturer to pay the already existing Ghanaian National Folklore Board a fee. The result is some money would go to Ghana and be distributed as the Folklore Board does, and the price of kente cloth ties would rise. The disclosure system would put pressure on the company to do something similar, but a little less pressure. Tibetan fabrics, excuse me, Tibetan rugs here both the delegation and the disclosure system would encourage more companies to adopt systems like Rialo, in which they create and publicize benefit sharing with the traditional weavers. The price of Tibetan rugs would go up. The Nepalese and the practitioners of Buddhism would benefit. And as to tango, Nothing. <laughs>